Congo is a unique uh, country where the United Nations has uh, sanctioned an offensive force. Otherwise, the UN uh, forces are only mandated to protect. They are not expected to go on, on, on an offensive uh, formation. So there is uh, an offensive force that is that is being sanctioned uh, to act against armed militias. Now, armed militias is the principal problem because these again are are uh, surviving or making most of uh, the absence of state authority on the one hand. And secondly, because of the kind of monies that are they are able to extract from the from from the minerals that that are present in these areas. For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Welcome to the gist on Strat News Global. Good evening, I'm Surya Gangadharan and I have a question. Is United Nations peacekeeping in crisis? I refer to the war in Ukraine now in its second year with no sign of any UN intervention. In fact, uh, no less than three of the uh, five Secretary Council heavyweights are involved in some way or the other. Uh, also, if you look at Sudan, where uh, the US and Saudi Arabia are backing different horses, uh, reducing Khartoum to a war zone. So what's going on here? I have with me General Shalesh Tanekar. He was a former UN force commander in South Sudan. Uh, he also served in the UN verification mission in Angola. Sir, glad to have you. Thank you, Surya. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, discuss this very important uh, subject. So what do you make of um, uh, the state of uh, UN peacekeeping today? Is there a crisis uh, there seems to be a serious crisis. You have a couple of wars going on with no end in sight, no UN intervention. And it seems that where the um, big heavyweights are involved, no intervention actually is possible. Uh, that is true. But this has been the story of the United Nations uh, for uh, as long as it has existed now for more than 75 years. As you are aware, the United Nations functions is an organization which functions through consensus. It requires consent of the parties involved. Yep. And uh, the primary organ that maintains international peace and security, of course, is the Security Council. Yep. The General Assembly does not have that, uh, that mandate. And uh, even in, in, in the recent crisis, when we saw that the, the Ukraine issue was, uh, uh, was forwarded uh, or was taken up by the General Assembly as, and debated and a resolution passed, the resolutions of the General Assembly, as you know, are rec recommendatory. So the principal responsibility for peace and security lies with the Security Council, and when it is divided, uh, it is not able to it is not able to respond uh, suitably. So that's where we are. We have seen this in the past during the Cold War years, when, uh, in spite of the UN being in existence, in spite of some very good missions being launched, we had 20 million dead. Post the Cold War, you had a, a large number of uh, say, uh, peacekeeping missions uh, that were uh, authorized, and they did a good job. But now, once again, we are uh, we are back in a situation where there is no unanimity in within the Security Council, and when such a state exists, the UN is not able to to respond. But that only relates to peacekeeping. You have. Uh, UN and the peacekeeping budget of the United Nations is, is small. Its other activities on the social and economic front are huge. Almost yeah. thrice the budget of, of for, for peacekeeping operations. So United Nations is active in all these war zones. They are providing the services and relief to people in distress, people who are most vulnerable. You have the UNHCR, you have food being provided by WFP. So yes, unfortunately, the war is continuing for more than a year. We are not a, UN is not able to stop it. Uh, there is a humanitarian crisis that is unfolding. The UN is doing its best to respond to that crisis, uh, but the but it's not able to stop the conflict. So, what about Yemen? Uh, that conflict is now nearly in its tenth year, and it's not that the big guys are involved there. Although perhaps you can say they have proxies, the Saudis are involved, uh, and although there's some kind of peace right now, it's not a peace that's going to last, or perhaps even looks very. Um, Durable. What's your yeah, reading? 
you see, the peacekeeping operation with the uh, military component is one response that the United Nations has. Uh, but in countries like Yemen and you found you and even in Sudan before this war uh, erupted, you had uh, a political mission in place. Now, a political yeah. mission does interact with uh, the parties of the conflict is is as inclusive as it could be. But the fundamental uh, principle of the United Nations of the United Nations uh, is consent of the parties. It respects the territorial integrity the political independence and sovereignty of each of its nations. And that reigns supreme. Although we have seen uh, this, uh, uh, these uh, principles being violated in the case of Rwanda, where the UN unfortunately was a silent spectator as more than half a million people died. But over yeah. a time, it has evolved in ways that it can use coercive force. But again, that needs unanimity within the Security Council. And consent of the parties to the conflict is a very, very, very important point that uh, uh, the Security Council as well as the General Assembly is very loath to violate. So that's where we stand. It is acting. But if the parties to the conflict are not willing to come to terms to each other, there is. A, and of course, the major powers uh, impose sanctions, impose uh, all kinds of uh, uh, economic as well as other sanctions, but but even then parties are able to hold and continue with the conflict. So this violates the basic tenets of the UN, resolving uh, conflicts through peaceful means, respect for human rights, uh, promoting friendly relations with between nations. So in that uh, uh, case, the UN is the sum, sum of all its members. And if there are members who are uh, refusing to abide by its tenets, then I'm afraid uh, conflicts are uh, liable to erupt in, in, in many regions of the world. And that's what ex that's exactly what we are seeing happening today. What about uh, Congo? You know, it has an elected government. Uh, it has all the structures of governance and all that. Yet you have UN peacekeepers sitting in places like Kivu and, and all those other locations. And there's some kind of a low um, kind of simmering insurgency of various kinds going on. How do you explain the UN presence in uh, Congo? The UN presence has uh, drawn down over the past two to three years and it is uh, planned to draw down even further. But then the eastern part of Congo is where the basic problem lies. And uh, there you have uh, a considerable intervention by the regional powers themselves, by the regional uh, countries. You have Rwanda, which has forces in that area, although it denies. You have Uganda with, uh, with its uh, military forces against the ADF, yeah. uh, which, is, which is present uh, in Congo. So the eastern part of Congo is also very rich in, in natural resources. And you have private militias, uh, various armed groups which are operating there. The state of Congo is not able to exercise its full authority in these areas. Uh, and then uh, an area which uh, has a large uh, population, civilians do get affected, civilians uh, do uh, get displaced, they do get killed. We've seen that over the last couple of uh, years, or sorry, uh, the uh, eastern part of Congo was seeing improvement. But over the last couple of months, you've seen an increase in violence. Yeah. Uh, and the UN has now um, stepped back against its planned uh, withdrawal, uh, drawdown in these areas. Uh, so that's what the state is. If you if you are able, if you pull out of Congo, you could once again see a reversal uh, to violence, and that would leave the UN once again uh, in a very uh, on a very poor poor footing. That it withdrew when it possibly knew that it's it's. Uh, Withdrawal would once again cause tremendous amount of harm, loss of lives, displacement, humanitarian crisis uh, to civilians. So you are once again caught in this in this game where uh, the state is not able to exercise its full authority in, 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 in areas in the eastern region where the UN force is largely deployed, where there are regional actors at play. Where there is now even a third, that is the East African community force, which has once again come in. The state mm -hmm. is free to enter into bilateral relations, bilateral deployments with, with countries. Uh, 
So you have a number of forces with different mandates operating in that area. So it's it's become kind of complicated, uh, complicated when there are so many forces of different uh, kinds attempting to bring peace to an area which for very long, you now Congo, the first operation, if you know, was launched in 1960, for yeah. very long has, has remained unstable. Uh, so that's where we are uh, at this point in time. Uh, the last report suggests that the president of Congo wants the UN to, to withdraw in full. Uh, but finally, he did step back. We found, uh, I think, in February this month, uh, there was a demonstration outside a camp in which uh, India lost two peacekeepers. Now, such kind of violence against uh, peacekeepers is really, really uh, uh, shows United Nations as a mission in, in, in very, very adverse terms. You're there to maintain peace, but if the civilians uh, get exercise and then they... Uh, attack peacekeepers and you have no right or no place to be there uh, so it's a it's a very difficult situation but uh, after after the after those uh, acts of violence uh, there has been some step back and uh, hopefully uh, the situation will get better with time mm -hmm. now you alluded to the role of regional players uh, western interest really and uh, it has been implied even uh, by earlier UN people that um, the uh, some of the major powers have a stake in Congo's uh, mineral resources. And they would not want this to slip out of their hands. And they may even be encouraging some of these local uh, warlords and militias, perhaps even the role of regional players. Yeah, there are reports, there are very confirmed reports by the United Nations saying that the Rwandan Defense Forces are involved, which Rwanda as a country has consistently denied. Uh, you have a large number of uh, people who committed genocide in 1994, which have taken refuge in Congo and in some ways have an organization uh, which is planning uh, to uh, unseat the government in Rwanda. Also, that's a very fry cry, but uh, the Rwanda is very, the Rwanda, the Rwandan government is. Uh, is concerned about this this group and would like to get most of their leaders to justice. So uh, the Rwanda's involvement in the eastern part of Congo will continue as long as those who committed genocide have taken refuge in those areas and have uh, men who are armed and have an organization called the ADRF. ADRF, I think, yeah. Uh, which uh, which plans to unseat, which has a plan to overthrow the Rwandan the present Rwandan government. That of course can't happen at this point in time. But as long as they continue to survive and live in eastern part of Congo, this Rwandan involvement obviously will be there. And yes, there are reports of uh, minerals being siphoned out from eastern part by various uh, neighboring nations. I would not like to comment on that. But uh, there are reports that this is definitely happening. You know, in places like Kivu, where our troops are based, um, it's basically a holding operation, isn't it, from what you're telling me? They are there to ensure things don't go under. And beyond that, really, there's nothing much to look forward to. Yeah, see, as Congo is a unique uh, country where the United Nations has uh, sanctioned an offensive force. Otherwise, the UN uh, forces are only mandated to protect. They are not expected to go on, on, on an offensive uh, formation. So there is uh, an offensive force that is that is being sanctioned uh, to act against armed militias. Now, armed militias is the principal problem because these again are are uh, surviving or making most of uh, the absence of state authority on the one hand. And secondly, because of the kind of monies that are, they are able to extract from the from from the minerals that that are present in these areas. So, with that uh, with that kind of uh, approach, I don't think the United Nations or its peacekeeping force can really make gains when its principal task is is protection of civilians. So, you have the East African community that has come in. Uh, you have some. Uh, the private militias which have been formed in, in these areas. Uh, 
uh, not as so much in Congo, but definitely in in Central African Republic as also in Mali, where there are reports of the Wagner Group in in yeah. in these areas. So you have a kind of a complex dynamics where, uh, as you quite rightly said, that the UN is in a holding role, and the regional powers uh, are uh, accused by the by the Congo by the, by the Congolese government of uh, constantly intervening in these areas and stealing their mineral wealth. Mm -hmm. And un the UN, unfortunately, is just uh, restricted to protection and not going on an offensive against the armed, armed militia. So that's where the situation stands as of now. You know, sir, from what you're telling me, it would appear that uh, the future of peacekeeping, if you want to call it that, is groups like this Wagner group. Because I understand they're active not just in Ukraine, also in Mozambique, I understand, perhaps even in Angola. Not so much. I'm not aware of that. But definitely there are reports of their presence in uh, Central African Republic, where there is a mission, MINUSCA, as you know, and also in Mali, where again there is MINUSMA, which exists as a mission. But this is uh, through bilateral agreements between the government and the concerned parties, where the UN does not have a major role to play, but definitely it complicates the issue. And as has been reported in, in Mali that uh, operations, uh, joint operations by the Malian Defense Forces as well uh, with the Wagner group or with the private militias has only served to further cause uh, a displacement of population, uh, further caused violation of human rights. And as, of, as we speak today, the the report suggests that about 400,000 400, have got displaced in, in Mali in its uh, in its northern and central region. So yes, the involvement of, of third parties does complicate, does complicate uh, the situation. But the UN has got really no role to play. Uh, the, the, the government of the, of the state is free to enter into any kind of bilateral relations or bilateral agreements uh, with the regional parties with private uh, groups uh, as they please or as it affects their their uh, security. So assuming, sir, that um, uh, India is asked to send um, troops under the UN mandate to Yemen, is this something you would recommend? <laughs> that's a that's a question you should pose to the to the foreign ministry because they are the ones who take the call in Yemen where. Uh, there is a civil war uh, between two groups uh, uh, and, of course, uh, involvement of Saudi Arabia and UAE. Uh, my recommendation from the kind of information that I have with me is certainly no. Hmm. <laughs> and there is no peacekeeping being planned. You see, if a peacekeeping operation is planned, firstly, of course, it, it, it has to receive... Uh, the approval by the Security Council, where there is a definite mandate. Uh, the process goes uh, in the way that uh, the Secretary General then, through the Department of Peacekeeping Operation, approaches various uh, countries who are willing to contribute troops. And based on uh, every uh, country's interests, needs, requirements, you are able to pitch in or uh, uh, suggest how many troops it could possibly provide for a peacekeeping operation. As of now, we haven't reached that stage. There is no discussion on, uh, on any peacekeeping operation in Yemen. As uh, Since 2014, since the last peacekeeping mission in uh, Central African Republic, there has been no peacekeeping operation with military uh, peacekeepers that has been sanctioned now almost for nine years. This is quite a departure from what we saw post uh, the end of Cold War, where I think uh, there were 51 operations which were sanctioned, peacekeeping missions which were sanctioned in the first uh, immediately post the ending of Cold War. And the United Nations or its Security Council, I think, has is gradually leave, losing faith in peacekeeping operation as a tool to bring about mm -hmm. peace. It seems to rely more on small political missions which is which are uh, of course uh, deployed within the country 
and are, and are able to talk to the parties to conflict and attempt to resolve the issues as we saw saw it play out in sudan but unfortunately sudan blew up in spite of the presence of a peace uh, of a, of a political mission in sudan uh, of course in many ways it could be a failure because they as even the secretary the srsg the uh, special representative of the security uh, secretary general in sudan was pretty surprised and taken aback by the scale of violence unleashed uh, when the president when the two heads of uh, the sudan uh, governing council uh, just about clashed when everything was supposed to be going as per them in a pretty smooth way you served you headed the mission in south sudan would you say um, the uh, mission uh, if a un mission were um, uh, do you see it likely that uh, you could see a un mission in sudan in the current yeah. situation yeah but definitely definitely so uh, should the should should the should the major parties that is one is hemeti and second is uh, president buran are able to come to some kind of an agreement and uh, then uh, sudan as a government accepts the deployment of peacekeepers within its country so the consent of the government is very important and consent of all parties to the dispute is is very important if peacekeepers have to be deployed if that is not present then peacekeepers will not get deployed you would be aware that uh, there was a mission there was a peacekeeping mission in sudan which closed down in 2011 once south sudan became independent and that yeah. was some parts converted into the present mission in in south sudan so sudan has seen a mission in the past and with the way with the kind of uh, violence displacement that you see uh, there could be a requirement of a mission in future but as of now there is there is been to, to the best of my uh, knowledge uh, this is not under discussion unless there are uh, some kind of parleys taking place behind closed doors of which i am not too sure mm -hmm. what is india's um, thinking about even missions are we can kind of turning away from them do we find them uh, perhaps not uh, useful no you are india india if you see has has always supported the un ever since its first mission so india is one of the principal supporters of of united nations peacekeeping once it had the largest number of peacekeepers deployed as of now it has about 6000 deployed in africa itself beyond that it has uh, contributed uh, to the uh, formation or construction of a un c4 c4 isr academy which is coming up in ntb it has also played a large part in bringing out a situational awareness platform for the united nations so in every way india supports un peacekeeping operations indian troops have performed reasonably well in every peacekeeping mission they are sought after troops Uh, we have troops now in congo i think there are two battalions in uh, south sudan there are two battalions in abia recently we put a battalion in mali we have peacekeepers deployed so india has a pretty large presence amongst un peacekeepers india takes a leadership role whenever peacekeeping operations are discussed within the security council uh it passed a resolution last year when uh, we were part we were uh, one of the non permanent mem members of the security council we took a lead in a resolution that sought to protect the peacekeeper safety and security of peacekeepers was one of the initiatives taken taken up by the indian mission in 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 new york so india does play a very very major role uh but but do we the, have do we get a do we have a role in framing the mandate of a mission really no we don't have why is that that is why that is, is done by the permanent members we don't have a role for example you have a mandate you have a, a country which is termed as a pen holder so the pen holders are the one who draft the mandate and uh, for south sudan it is uh, united kingdom for mali as well as for central african republic it is 
it is france so you have these all peacekeeping mission mandates which are uh, which are the responsibility of pen holders and they are only members the permanent members of the security council india does not have a role to play in drafting any mandate but yes india when it is part of the security council as even as a non permanent member it does vote on it when it is not a part of the security council it has no role to play uh, within so that's where things stand so in your view given that uh, it's mostly the um, forces of developing countries that uh, go for un missions um would you say that uh, one of the requirements for reform would be this that the guys who are actually sending their troops into such places should be the ones framing the mandate well yes uh, they are consulted definitely and they have an option whether to participate or no but india is a major contributor india is such a large country india has got uh, huge stakes with, uh, within the un system i think india should always be be consulted uh, it is consulted but it should it should possibly have also a role in adding its inputs to the mandate which as of now unfortunately it does not have mm -hmm. so um, final question most of these missions seem to be in africa any particular reason yeah it is still coming out of of uh, the colonial uh, uh, colonial uh, colonial colonial um, what what is the right word for it uh, it has unyoked itself right? and it has yeah. not yet come out in full so there are parts regions in the sahel which are seeing a worsening of conflict you have the conflict in south sudan which somehow is not going away south sudan you have a uh, peacekeeping force now uh, since 2011 so almost 12 years that's too long peacekeeping operations are not supposed to last for so long yeah mm -hmm. uh, there is supposed to be an agreement and the government and the parties to the conflict are supposed to implement that agreement within a definite time frame now they are not able to do so you have you had a civil a kind of a civil war, war in ethiopia and now you have uh, once again a civil war in in sudan now you see yeah. sudan and ethiopia were the guarantors of the peace agreement in south sudan and if these two nations themselves are so unstable i wonder what could happen to the peace mm. agreement and the peace process in south sudan yeah you have yeah. an increased presence of jihadis in mali which they have taken over most of the north and central parts of mali the french and the european mission has withdrawn from mali so you have a problem there yeah you have a problem brewing up in chad because what happens in sudan affects darfur and what happens in darfur affects chad uh, you have the wider sahel getting affected sahel as you know is sub saharan africa basically yeah. uh, form, forming uh, uh, nations in 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 the western part of africa that is getting affected so it the conflict such as this have a have a tendency to destabilize an entire region Uh, why is it ha happening in africa well they have not yet some states have not yet been able to to establish a firm state presence all across their country they mm -hmm. lack institutions they have huge mineral mineral resources which are being exploited as of now by various parties in 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 sudan you see uh, oil as well as gold being uh, mined and illegally uh, shipped out so those interests are at work and when a state when the basic state and its government is 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 weak is not able to extend its authority across you have an increasing presence of armed militias terrorist groups are coming up and with minerals you have uh, transnational economic uh, linkages which get formed yeah so you have an area which is i would say lawless and such lawless large lawless areas definitely will Uh, impact adversely international peace and security and it could possibly affect the entire region and the globe hmm. so the fundamental reason i feel is poor states weak states weak governance weak institutional framework concentration of power with a few the lack of participatory democracy as we would see violation of human rights hmm. poor law and order so these are some of the uh, reasons why in a particular area of africa 
you have these problems coming through. You have South Africa, which is, well, it is stable, yeah. all right. You have <laughs> Mozambique, you have Eritrea. UN has played a very important role in, in stabilizing these nations. They are not perfect democracies, agreed. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they haven't uh, reverted to civil war. They haven't reverted to conflict. And UN has been successful in these missions. As for uh, uh, what I've read, uh, 16, UN has participated in 16 civil war situations in in Africa, out of which it was successful in 11. So that's a pretty good uh, good number. And wherever UN has been deployed, they haven't reverted back to civil wars. They have brought down the uh, levels of conflict. Uh, they have uh, stopped or at least, I, I won't say stopped, but reduced uh, sexual and gender-based violence. So UN presence so, does make a difference. So final quick word, sir. Future of UN peacekeeping. How do you see it? It has to change. It can't go on. The kind of challenges that are being faced are evolving. And the UN has to evolve in step with those changes. So I do feel, although there have been an agenda of agenda of change that has been, that was uh, publicized uh, and accepted by the General Assembly uh, in uh, November 20. But you saw the Ukraine conflict start in Feb 21. Yeah. <laughs> Even though the United Nations accepted a common agenda for peace, you have conflicts mm -hmm. which are erupting. As far as peacekeeping operations are concerned, they have to evolve. Uh, there has to be a stronger commitment from all parties. UN is only a reflection of its members. UN mm -hmm. is not a kind of a separate entity, an outside entity that is, that is attempting to intervene. And if the members are not able to come together, are not able to stand together and uphold the ideals and principles of the United Nations, then only it just remains on paper. So the principal responsibility lies with the host nation, lies with the regional region, and then the wider international community. So, in, so the, uh, any resolutions that we pass, any great statements that we make come to nothing if the members of the United Nations are not able to stand to their word. And if past history is any guide, this is going to be really testing time. So, grim prognosis, General Thanekar, thank you very much. Uh, great perspective from you. Thank you, Surya. It was a pleasure. And for those of you who joined us on this conversation, uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, follow us on social media, Twitter. And thank you and good night.